Next, we're going to hear from Barbara Lariah, who is a professor at UC Berkeley. She's been studying um, maternal health and nutrition for 20 years, studying the effects of food insecurity and psychological stress on nutrition and weight, particularly during pregnancy. She's leading a phenomenal study following black and white girls from Richmond, California from 40 years ago. They were born 40 years ago. And she's now following them and their, their babies and looking at the transmission of obesity and, and effects um, on, for example, the microbiome. She is also an uh, advisor to many government dialogues and agencies on nutrition guidelines. So for example, she was on the IOM committee that was evaluating SNAP, our federal food assistance program. Thank you, Barbara. So I was tasked today to talk about stress and obesity, um, work I do do with Alyssa Eppel and others. Uh, first, a bit of bad news. I don't know if anyone saw last week that Gallup came out with its annual survey that looks at global stress. They measure global stress by interviewing over 1,000 people in 147 different countries, and they ask questions about stress, worry, sadness, physical pain, and anger. And the scale is from 1 to 100. And uh, last year, in 2017, if um, you were stressed, you weren't alone. Uh, it's the highest average global stress measure um, with a score of 30 out of the 100 since they started this uh, survey in 2006. And the United States uh, scored 32, so slightly higher than the global average. War-torn countries um, and lower-income countries scored much higher than this, as you would expect. Um, but the United States was the fourth highest uh, ranked in their stress among um, high-income countries. Okay, so how does this stress get under the skin? And so uh, this mechanism is pretty well described, and uh, I see it as it takes kind of these four hits. First, stress kind of overwhelms us, and um, and it wreaks havoc on our reward system. So highly palatable food becomes that much more stimulating. And then uh, it influences our reasoning center, and it overwhelms, overwhelms us and um, influences our decision making, executive function, and self-regulation. Now, that's an, not enough. It's, it's when we actually change our behavior and reach for that highly palatable food, the cookie, or your snack food du jour, um, and that we see this health behavior change. And then in the environment of stress, where our hormones shift, we actually eat that cookie and metabolize it differently and store it centrally around our waistline. So here's a little graphic. Um, the stress influences that limbic system, the emotion system. Um, it stimulates and makes that cookie or whatever more palatable or more stimulating. So our reward system lights up. That influences our prefrontal cortex where regulation is taking place. So it's much more difficult to be mindful. That's where we really need to have a second thought before we reach for that cookie. But we um, often do reach for the cookie, that comfort food. Uh, and the last step is that it is stored as fat. But in addition to all this, once we do reach for that cookie and eat it, then the next time we experience stress, even lower levels of stress, we're more likely to reach for the cookie. So it's, it becomes habit forming. And that's kind of a recipe for obesity right there. Now, how does this fit in with the social exposome? So by social exposome, um, I'm talking about kind of concentrated areas of poverty and neighborhoods with high crime and poor safety. These concentrated areas of poverty, this is the map from 2013, these are neighborhoods where more than 40% of households live below the poverty line. More than 40% of households living below the poverty line. And in addition to poverty and crime, with a, food, with a poor food environment, this concentration of fast food, um, which do, do reside in more likely in low-income neighborhoods or near them, 
Um, this is a recipe for uh, stress and for obesity. And why these are considered kind of the social exposome is because they're socially constructed neighborhood structures. We create these through our laws, regulations, and policies. We create um, these environments. So I want to talk briefly about neighborhood deprivation, which is a specific measure that has been around for several decades. And neighborhood deprivation takes this notion of poverty a little step further because we know that poverty is highly, highly correlated with poor um, job opportunities, high unemployment, low education, um, and uh, um, poor housing. And we can't just think about poverty itself because they're so highly correlated. We need to think about interventions um, across these different domains. Neighborhood deprivation, for two decades we're having, we have literature that associates neighborhood deprivation with higher BMI, higher risk for obesity, higher risk for severe obesity, and predicts weight gain among adults and among adults with diabetes. And it also is associated with child weight and obesity. So this socially constructed area structures, this neighborhood deprivation is associated, we know, consistently with BMI and obesity. And so not until we can really address these underlying social structures, I don't think that we're going to really have much chance in swaying or changing the trajectory of um, obesity. So lastly, I just want to mention pregnancy. Neighborhood deprivation is directly associated with maternal stress. There's studies that show high income, uh, low income neighborhoods are associated with maternal stress. It's associated with poor health behaviors, reduced physical activity, poor dietary intake, and poor weight gain during pregnancy. So, you know, we need to address this to help not only the pregnant women and our communities, but also the next generation. And it's not just these lowest um, na poverty neighborhoods. There's a dose response. So compared to the wealthiest neighborhoods, anything less wealthy is, has this higher risk of weight gain, higher BMI, and obesity. It's not just the poorest compared to the wealthiest. It's everybody compared to the wealthiest. So un unless we can all move to the wealthiest neighborhoods, I think um, we, we need to address this across um, all neighborhoods. So high stress resulting from poor and underserved, under-resourced neighborhoods influences the health for generations. It's not just us, it's um, the pregnant women and the developing fetus and our children. Thanks.